there. Thanks for tuning in to one of our online sermons today. My name is Brianna Grunwald, and I'm the River Kids Director here at our Burton location at the River Church. And we'd love to connect with you today. One of the ways that you can connect is by texting River Connect one word, to 970-00, or by visiting our website at theriverchurch.cc to see more about who we are, what we do, and our upcoming events. If you'd like to give to the River Church, you can do so by texting that dollar amount to 84321, or by clicking the Give tab on our website. We hope you're blessed and encouraged by the message today. One of the things that probably you've picked up by now uh, from being around me or talking to me or hearing pretty much me talk for any length of time is I'm a huge nerd, right? I, I am a huge nerd. I love movies. Uh, I specifically like nights have always stuck out to me. And I'm here to tell you that's not my fault. That is not my fault. You can't blame me for that. Because as I grew up, my dad, he, as he raised me, he used this idea of a night to talk about what it looked like to become a man. And so as he raised me from when I was just a young child all the way, even now, he continues to instill uh, these godly manhood qualities in me, and he uses this analogy of knighthood. And what I mean by that is if you don't really know um, much about knighthood in medieval times, um, typically there's a couple different stages that every knight goes through right? They're normally just a normal person, right? And they have nothing to deal with. And that's like a kid, right? A, a kid, you know, sorry, kids, if you're here in the room, you ha don't have a ton of responsibilities. You don't have uh, a ton of things that are on your plate or that weigh you down. And there's not a lot of expectations on you. And then there's this, this aspect of becoming a young man, uh, and, and he used this analogy of a squire. And now a squire was like a knight in training. And, and a squire usually just kind of like followed around in the back. They weren't really involved in like battles. They would lug around equipment. They'd carry shields. They'd make sure that, you know, the horses were, you know, brushed and taken care of. The armor was polished, all that different stuff. And then there was the knight, right? The guy, the soldier, the knight, the man who rode in on the horse. But then there was always the knight among knights. And this was the champion. And the champion was like the leader of knights, right? And so my dad kind of compared these to these different stages of, of this journey of becoming a man. And the squire was this picture of a young man, right? A man in training who's looking to learn and understand what it means to be a man, that, uh, um, a young man who is equipping or, or seeking to uh, learn from and, and help in whatever aspect that may look like in the household in church, whatever that may be. And then there is the night, right? Becoming a man, right? Becoming a man, falling into the role which you've been training for and, and taking on these different responsibilities and all these different things. And then the champion, right? The leader among men, the leader of men. And along these different periods or points in my journey uh, that my dad had kind of worked with me through, he had done some really cool but really nerdy things. And, and so I remember when I became a young man, uh, my dad, he gave me like this really cool medieval dagger. Uh, and it's, it's sitting on my mantelpiece at home uh, because it's something that I, I value, I cherish. And then when I became a man, he bought me this shield, this, this cool knight shield, and it's hanging up in my office uh, down in Waterford, uh, at the Waterford location. And, and though those things are cool, though those things have sentimental meaning for me, and, you know, the nerd in me, you know, rejoices when I get to pick up a shield or a dagger, right? The, the things that I cherish even more was my dad, as he did this, he went around to men who I deeply respected. And he had them write letters to me. And in those letters, he had them talk about the qualities of manhood and what that looked like. And, and what it looked like for me in this journey to becoming a man, what some things that I, were, I was doing really well 
and were some areas of being a man that I needed to work on and I needed to focus on. And I remember I valued those letters with such importance. I, I still know where they are in my house. And, and, I, and occasionally, whenever I feel discouraged or whenever I feel like, man, I just, maybe I'm not living up to the man that I should be, I will go back and I'll read those letters to remind myself of the ways in which I need to refocus. The ways in which I need to be called back to living as a godly man. Now, I don't tell you this, you know, to, to just focus on this idea of manhood because it's this aspect really of living the way in which we're supposed to live, both as men and women of God. And Jesus, through or through John, in the book of Revelation, communicates similar things to the different churches at the time. He tells them some ways in which they're living and honoring God, and some ways in which, if they want to honor God, they need to fix and improve or, or work harder and focus on. And this morning, we're going to take a look at specifically one church, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at more. Um, but before we do that, let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, we're, we focus this morning on you. Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, that we would be encouraged. Lord, as we look at your word, we would be challenged. And that as we look at your word, we would see you. In your precious name, Jesus' name, amen. So open with me to the book of Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. We're going to be in chapter 1. So go to the very end of your Bible. Go to the first chapter. Boom, you're there. Couldn't be quicker. And as we look at this, this book of Revelation, it can be so easy sometimes, right? When we hear Revelation, we hear about, you know, the impending apocalypse, right? That it talks about when we read all these different things. There can be this fear that creeps in. This fear of, oh no, what's going to happen? Of trying to look everywhere. Oh, it's coming. It's here. Who knows what's going to happen? What's, what's going on? What we can know. That's why we're, we're looking at scripture so that we can know these things. Because here's the thing. Revelation is given to us to not produce fear of what's coming, but fear of the Lord. And that fear of the Lord is not a, a fear that we should be scared or terrified or be, you know, just running for cover or, you know, constantly in fear of what's about to happen. No, that fear of the Lord should produce an honor and reverence for Jesus Christ. He who created, saved, and will return in the end. And it's important that as we read the book of Revelation that we go into it with that mindset. Right? That this is not supposed to cause us this anxiety about our world today, but creating us an honor and a reverence for Jesus. That we look at this and we say, yes, Jesus created, Jesus saved, and Jesus will fulfill his promise and return. He is in control. He is supreme. He is creator and destroyer. And in Revelation, it's more than just about looking forward, but about looking inward, looking, about, looking at ourselves and judging ourselves and making sure that we are presentable for Christ when he arrives. Because as we look in Scripture, specifically this morning, we're going to start in Revelation 1, verse 19, and Jesus is telling John to write these things down because he's going to give some specific instru instructions to seven different churches. And he's going to give them warnings. He's going to tell them some things that they're doing well and that some things that they're not doing well. And for us, that's not some, something where we look and say, well, why does that matter? I'm not part of that church. The reason we look at that is because it is relevant to us today. If that church struggle with it, odds are we probably do too. And so if we do, we need to figure out how we can follow their example and avoid their pitfalls. 
right? To, to honor Christ the way in which they do and to seek to avoid disobedience in the way in which they do as well. So in Revelation chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, it says this, Write therefore the things that you have seen. This is Jesus talking to John. Those that Uh, that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, there are seven stars, or the seven stars are angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So John has this vision. He sees who at the time he didn't know, but then he realizes to be Jesus. And Jesus is standing there with seven stars and seven lampstands. And uh, we see in, in Scripture, it talks about how important Jesus is there. Now, I'm not going to take a second and talk about that this morning because I know myself, and it wouldn't be a second. It would be an hour and a half. Uh, so I would encourage you to make sure that you go back and read that section. But as we look here, Jesus tells John that there are seven churches that I want to address. There are seven churches that are around here that kind of are the pillars of what's going on in early Christianity. They're important to me, and there are some important things that are going on in them. And so I want to address them. So take notice, write this down, and communicate it to them. And we see that, once again, this is relevant to us. Right? If it was just solely about, you know, these prophecies that weren't supposed to happen for thousands and thousands of years, what John would have done is he would have written this stuff down and he would have buried it for us to find later on. He would have made a spiritual time capsule. But he didn't do that. He knew that this stuff was relevant, that it affected the lives of the early churches now, and that Jesus, as he communicated to John, He had some things that he needed to say that they needed to know now. And it's important for us because we need to know this stuff now. And so this morning, I'd encourage you to listen and to apply this to you. Okay? So turn with me to Revelation 2. Flip right there. It says this. Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 1. says this. To the angel of the church... In Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So he says, all right, here's what I need you to do. First, we're going to deal with Ephesus. And so the question becomes, what is going on? Who is the church at Ephesus? And you may look at me and you say, Justin, why do we need to know the context why do we need to know like who Ephesus was? Why can't we just read the stuff and, and realize its importance? Here's the reason why. And I, this is something that I think is so missed a lot of times. We don't ever take a second to look at why and who things are being written to. Why is Jesus addressing Ephesus? Who is the Ephesian church? And this is important because here's the thing. If I'm writing a letter and you're reading this letter, It's important for you to know who I'm writing to because some of the things that I say cannot be fully understood unless you understand who I'm writing to. Take, for instance, if I am writing to my wife, to uh, my sister, or to one of my best friends, my college roommate, if I say I love you to that person, I love you means very different things in those three contexts. Right? If I say that to my college roommate, he understands there's this deep brotherly love and affection, right? That we've been through some really tough things together. He's seen me at my worst. He's challenged me to do some really hard things. Right? If I'm writing to my sister, it's this familial love, this care for one another, knowing that we've grown up together and that we see things in similar ways and and that I have a care and concern for her. And if I write to my wife that I love you, there is this romantic side, both a a love and care and concern, but also an admiration and a desire, right? And so it's important to know who is being written to because the context in which things are being said hits a little bit different, right? So this morning, as we look at the church of Ephesus, I want you to turn 
to Ephesians chapter 1. Leave your, leave your finger here in Revelation because we're going to be back. But Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be in verse 15. You see, the context of the Ephesian church, the Ephesian church was like kind of like the golden child of the early church, of the early spiritual or early Christianity. Not only was Ephesus an extremely desirable place to live. Actually, Ephesus means desirable. It was centered in this place that uh, had some great seaports and it was kind of the hub of commerce in the ancient world. Not only was it desirable from a standpoint of the world, but also it was a place that many of the disciples had influence in. Specifically, Paul founded the church, Paul the Apostle. Right? How many times, you know, ever has the church been able to be like, yeah, um, who started our church again? Oh, yeah, uh, Paul. <laughs> right? Like, that's, a, that's craziness, right? That would be crazy if our founding pastor was Paul the Apostle. But not only that, Timothy had been there, had been sent there, had showed up, had lived there for an extensive period of time, had taught them, had preached the gospel to them, was in charge of instructing them and making sure that they were living in the ways that they were supposed to. He set up their congregation. He did all this different stuff as instructed by Paul later on. And then on top of that, John, the, the recorder of Revelation, was there for a substantial period of time. It's actually believed that he lived there for a long period of time, and wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in their midst. You see, they were, they were so influenced by the, the pillars of the Christian faith. They had a book of the Bible written to them, a letter that Paul wrote. You see, they were focused on Jesus. And we see that they were focused on Jesus because in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16, before Paul gets into the meat of what he's trying to teach them, he acknowledges, yes, you are important and for good reason. You have a desperate love for Jesus. It says this, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers. For all the headaches that Paul had in the early Christian church, he was thankful for them because of their significant love for Christ. But the thing is, oftentimes, the way things start are always the way things end. And we jump back to Revelations 2 because Jesus, he... He sees some great things which they do, and then he sees some ways in which they've wandered away. And I want us to look, because I think both of, us, both of them are super important to us as we live today. So going back to Revelation 2, starting in verse 2, it says this, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. And how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. And so Jesus looks and says, great job, great job. You have done a great job. I know all these things. I've seen all these things. You are doing a great job. Specifically, when it comes to avoiding sin, calling out sin, specifically in your brothers and sisters in Christ. You, of all the things, you did not tolerate the world's influence. You sat, and while everyone else conformed, while everyone else said that they followed me and still follow the world, you remain true. And you were not hesitant when people in your midst started to get distracted. You did not hesitate to call them back to the gospel, to remind them of the obedience in which they should live. You did not tolerate falsehoods spoken by people who said that they were apostles because you knew 
Because you read the letters given to you by Paul. You respected what Timothy came and did while I was among you. And you lived, this is John, you did not conform. You did not fall. You remained faithful. You did not cave to what you knew was wrong. Great job. That's a great job. But unfortunately, I don't believe that Jesus would say the same for the American church. I don't. I wish that I believed he would say the same, but week after week, I see churches, both mega churches, small local churches, conform their beliefs on hot button sin issues because they feel the pressure of the world to conform their moral standing to be more acceptable. And this is a sad truth. And we know there's things that are going through our mind. This issue, that issue. I don't need to get up here and say which one specifically. In general, our, our society is pressuring us to accept all, practice all, do all, respect all, even if those things are evil. And more and more, church after church says, you know what? I'm done fighting it. I'm done trying to pretend I can't keep this up. Maybe this isn't what the Bible says. Maybe I'll cut and paste different places in Scripture to make it more suitable or palatable to the people who are coming in my door because I want them to like me. Over and over and over, we see church after church say, Eh, is it really? Is it really evil? Is it really wrong? When scripture is firm, scripture is true, scripture is clear. And so one of the things that I love about the River Church is we say we hold to what scripture says. It's not us. It's, it's what Jesus has called us to. And the Ephesian church sits as a reminder that we must stand strong. That Jesus looks at them in the face of all the adversity uh, of their world. A Roman occupation that wanted to destroy Christianity. The Ephesian church stood strong. We cannot tolerate Pastors or church leaders who want to conform the gospel of Jesus to be palatable to a culture where acceptance is king. We can't. We can't give them our ear. We can't pretend like that's okay. It's not. And if I ever say anything contrary to scripture, I hope one of you tackles me off this stage. <laughs> Truthfully. Because that's what would happen in Ephesus. They would not stand. There was false teacher after false teacher after false teacher, and they said, you know where the door is. We're not dealing with that. We follow Jesus. He has given us clear direction, and we will not waver. We cannot tolerate people who claim to be believers but say that sin is okay, because it's not. Now, please do not hear this as a license to be rude and hurtful to people. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm not saying is anytime someone does something that you know is wrong or sinful, that it's your job to go and verbally destroy them. That is not what is happening. That's not what we're called to. Ephesus was known for being a place of love. A place where there was brotherly love and affection, where people were called back to the gospel. People who were won over by a love for people. But what we have to do is we have to see their motivation for what was right and what was evil. And we have to be motivated to remind people of the gospel and the truth of scripture. And what that takes is us knowing what the Bible says. You can't call people to 
to be come back to what Scripture says if you don't know how to do that in the first place. If you don't know what Scripture says in the first place, or you're not living that way at all. And so, as we look here, we should be motivated by Jesus, for Jesus, to remain in truth. And as Jesus continues, he, he, he starts us off with like the good news, and then he moves to some not so good news, right? And continue with me in verse four. Jesus continues his statement to the Ephesian church by issuing them a warning. And I think on top of this morning as we look and we say, man, this is one area that we struggle with. This is another area which we need to look at and focus on. It says this. But I have this against you. And I don't know about you, but hearing Jesus say that, whew, that would be terrifying. Jesus says, I got this against you. We got beef here. It says this, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear that the Spirit sa- what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is paradise is in the paradise of God. What Jesus says here is, you have done all these incredible things. You have remained steadfast to the truth. You have remained knowing and calling people to right versus wrong. But there's one fatal flaw. You abandoned the thing that started it all. You forgot the thing that put this all into motion. For you, this has become same old, same old, and you forget why you are doing what you're doing. And to understand the, the love or the first love that Jesus is talking about here through John, go back to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 23. As Paul writes and he closes his book, he reminds them why all the things that he just wrote about are important. And he appeals to the way in which they're living. He appeals to their heart because their heart is very much wrapped up into one thing. He says this, Ephesians chapter six, verse 23 and 24. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. He says, this love, yeah, the reason why you're gonna do all these things, and Jesus looking and saying, you've been doing all these things, but you've forgotten the one reason you did them, that love was love for Jesus. All this stuff started out of a love for Jesus Christ as their Savior, a desire to honor him and serve him and glorify him and preach the gospel because for them, it was good news. They looked and they were motivated by the gospel. They were motivated to see right and wrong and to call their brothers and sisters back or call unbelievers away from unrighteousness because they loved Christ because he had done that for them. There was this incredible love and and a desire to follow Jesus because they loved him and saw him as Savior. And somehow, in the practice of it all, it had become lost. They were willing to go through the motions of religion. They were willing to, to call out people for right and wrong. They were so focused on trying to prove themselves through the motions of religion that they lost all semblance of relationship. You see, Jesus didn't save us for religion. 
If you look all the way back, God created us for relationship. He created us to glorify him through a relationship with him. And when we sinned, we broke that relationship. And there was nothing that we could do to fix that relationship. We tried everything. We tried to be a good person. We tried to create other ways. We tried to go it alone, and still we come up short. But Jesus came. Jesus came, and he lived. Jesus, the Son of God, who lived a perfect life and still died and suffered and then rose again, the reason he did that was not so that we could have this sense of morality. It was so that that relationship could be restored. And so he reminds the Ephesian church, don't lose sight. Don't lose sight of why I did this. Don't lose sight of why you did this. It's love. It's a mutual love. I have love for you, and you had love for me. You were focused on me. You were focused on following me because you loved me. And now it's just empty action over and over and over. You see, in their quest to root out evil and wrong, they began to forget who had freed them from the evil that they had done. And often we do the same exact thing. We do. We spend more time complaining about the state of our world, culture, or country than we ever do talking about the greatness of Jesus Christ. We do. We love to sit in the break room at work and complain about this politician or that political party or that decision or this thing on the news or that horrible thing that happened in our world this last week. But when was the last time we sat in the break room and we talked about the greatness of Jesus Christ? Man, that's a convicting thought. That's a hard thought. And that should remind us, like, wait, are we more focused on just trying to be good, or are we focused on Jesus? It's so easy for us to just go through the motions, for us to forget even why we do church, why we come together, right? We stand, we sit, we sing. We do announcements, we stand, we sing, we sit, we listen to a preacher, we pray, we stand, we sing, we leave. And we just do that over and over and over again. And for us, it becomes monotonous. And we just show up because it's the right thing to do. Instead of showing up on Sunday because we are ready to worship him who we are deeply infatuated with. We are in love with Christ. You see, some of us are on autopilot in our relationship with Christ. It's becoming just a, hey, as long as I don't do that. And Jesus says, stop it. Stop it. It's more. Focus up. Don't forget why you started this. You started this because you said you were a sinner and you were in need of a savior and I was that savior and you said you loved me and you wanted to follow me. So start. And do it for the reason of love, not just because you know your wife's going to be on you. Or you know, you know this person will judge you if not. No, it's about a deep love. He says, I did this for a relationship with you. You should choose obedience, not because people want you to, not because you're part of some exclusive club, which people think church is, but because you love him who loved us in our sin. Man. And as we look at what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, we should view it as this incredible reminder, a sobering reminder of what that looks like, right? He says in verse seven, or no, sorry, in verse five, remember therefore where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There's a reason you don't hear about the Ephesian church anymore. It's because they didn't. They didn't get together. This wasn't warming or warning enough. They may have fixed it for a time, but it didn't last. 
And now in a region that is dominated by Muslims, we don't see the church at all. That should be a warning to us. We want to be people who are devoted to Jesus so that other people can experience the gospel. So that the gospel leaves this building in Davison and it reaches our community, it reaches our state. Because we are in love with him who loved us first. You see, like I said at the beginning, while in Ephesus, John, he wrote the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And as I was just reading over them this last week, I couldn't help but imagine that as Jesus dictated these words to John in this revelation, that John's mind had to have gone back to the words that the Holy Spirit dictated to him as he wrote 1 John. And so if you would turn with me to 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. You see, as we close, I want you to, to, to listen to what John has to say in 1 John chapter 4. And I want that to be your application from this morning. I, I, I don't want to get in the way of what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. And so I'm just going to read his word. But I want to remind, I want this to be a reminder about what his love is. Why we do community. Why we seek holiness. Why we praise and worship. Why we get together as believers. It's the love of Christ. And that's what John has to say. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to pray. He says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 through 21. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. I'm going to read that one more time. We love because he first loved us. And if anyone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have found, or we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Let's pray.